Yeah, we will uh, begin with Second Samuel today. Yesterday, of course, we were looking at Samuel, Saul, and David, who are discussed in three sections of uh, Samuel. So now we are moving into Second Samuel, which is mainly all about King David and his uh, forty-year rule. Okay, so um, here in Second Samuel, you have two genres, two types of writing mentioned. Of course, most of it is narrative history because it's giving the history of King David. But you also have two psalms of praise around the ending of the book, where uh, they are written in the form of a uh, poem, a hymn, a song. So you have two genres of writing. You have the narrative history, and you also have two psalms or two songs of praise. Uh, who are the key personalities? Of course, we have David. Uh, his commander Joab, uh, then of course Nathan and Bathsheba, uh, because of the sin which he commits. There's also Absalom, you know, who rebels against his father. So these would be the main characters. Mm, coming to the structure of Second Samuel, uh, the first, yeah, we could say that the book can be divided into three portions. Uh, the first section will be about all the victories and the uh, the, the triumphs which he had, all the things which went well for him. The second section would be his failures, uh, you know, the things in which he did badly. And the third section can be said to be uh, the consequences of his bad actions. So um, if we are looking at it in, at it in the, this way, uh, chapters 1 to 10, we'll talk about his victories, we'll talk about his triumphs, uh, chapter 11 is basically where David commits a sin, which has very terrible consequences. So all the problems which start after um, chapter 11, chapter 12 onwards, 12 to 24, describes all the bad things which happened to him. And uh, many of those things are actually connected to his sinful act. So he brings it upon his own head by doing that uh, you know, sinful deed. So... Chapters 1 to 10, um, we see how um, he was king only of Judah in the beginning. So for seven and a half years, he's only the king of Judah. And um, what about the rest of the nation? The rest of the Israelites, they have Ishbosheth, who is Saul's son. He is the king for, over the rest of the kingdom. And then, of course, after seven and a half years, they come and request him to be their king also. So he becomes the king over the entire nation. Um, and he is the one who chooses to make Jerusalem the capital, because till then, Jerusalem was not considered very important. Uh, but now he makes it his capital. And he also brings the ark into the capital. So those are the things we see in chapters 1 to 10. And then uh, chapters 11 to 24 is where you have the act of you know, adultery and then the murder which he commits and Nathan co confronting him and correcting him. Uh, you also have the rebellion of his son Absalom who wants to ascend the throne. And uh, so that all of that would be found in chapters 11 to 24. Um, so coming to his kingship, how he is made king. We see that he is very humble um, You know, in the beginning. He asks for God's permission. He says, Lord, shall I go and be king over Judah? And then God says, "You know, go ahead. And that is how he chooses to become king over just Judah. And uh, the capital is Hebron. So the rest of the tribes, they all um, choose to be under Ishbosheth. So the commander of Saul's army, Abner. Abner is the man who was the commander of Saul's army. He appoints uh, Saul's son, Ishbosheth as the new king. And everyone celebrates his uh, kingship. Uh, but Abner was not just acting out of loyalty towards his master, Saul. He actually had his own um, agenda. He was hoping to somehow one day displace Ishbosheth and climb on the throne himself. So he, he did not appoint Saul's son because he had any good heart. He had other ulterior motives. Uh, because we see that shortly afterwards, 
um, he chooses to sleep with Saul's concubine. You know, Saul would have had many concubines. So he chooses to sleep with one of the concubines. So that it's like an indication, a public declaration that, you know, I have uh, taken the king's wife. So if I have taken the king's wife, it's like I'm making a claim to the throne and I'm declaring that I'm, you know, one of the contenders for the throne because that's basically how it was done in their culture. If uh, uh, if you if anyone who is powerful enough, strong enough, is able to take hold of the king's wives, then uh, it's like as if he's declaring, you know, I am the new uh, king. I am the one who has a right to the throne and I'm willing to go to battle for it. So. It's rather sad in those days women were not considered important at all they had all completely forgotten genesis 1 you know where it very clearly says that both man and woman was created in the image of god but somehow along the way in especially in their culture uh, women lost the status of being created in god's image they were not given the value which they deserved so they basically were used like pawns uh, so in, when it came to political circles uh, marriages were purely for, you know, political alliances, uh, for what power they can gain by, you know, marrying some particular person. And uh, so even over here, we see the concubines usually are the ones who get attacked uh, when someone wants to take over the throne because they go and they take the concubines first because, you know, to declare that I am now trying to go for the throne. So we see that happening over here. So when Ishposheth is very upset and he says, you know, why have you done this? Why have you taken my father's concubine? He says, no, no, I've not done that. So we're not very sure whether he really did it or he was planning on doing it. We are not very sure. But one thing is uh, clear. Ishbosheth is very unhappy about it. And he says, why? Why have you done that? And then Abner is very offended. And he says, no, 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 you're wrongly accusing me. Because you have done this, I will now make David king instead. Okay, so he switches sides. And um, in fact, he goes to David uh, to talk about it. Um, and um, But when Abner comes over here to talk to David about making him king over all of Israel, there's a lot of conspiracy going on. Uh, this is what we see in you know, 2 Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. A lot of political conspiracies going on. Everyone very desperate for power very similar to the kind of politics that we see today. Um, only, of course, uh, our politicians don't use swords and go into battle. Uh, they're more cunning. They're more subtle. Uh, they have their own uh, weapons, which are secret weapons. But in those days, they were more innocent, let us say. They would just auto, you know, honestly use their swords and go into battle. So um, when um, Abner comes to David, to talk about how you know he's going to make David king, and they're having discussions regarding that. Uh, his commander, David's commander, Joab. Joab, in fact, I think was a nephew, one of the nephews of uh, David. Um, so, or was he a nephew of Saul? I can't remember my facts. Sorry, so sorry, but he's somebody's nephew. Uh, kind of slips my mind right now. Joab. So Joab is the commander of uh, David. And Joab has got a personal grudge against Abner because in an earlier battle which took place at Gibeon, um, Abner had uh, killed his brother Asahel. And so Joab does not like Abner. Uh, so when Abner comes over here to have talks with David, um, he doesn't like it. And so he uses some trickery, calls him aside, acts like as if he's, as if he's about to talk to him, but instead he stabs him um, and you know just to clear the record Abner did not want to kill his brother uh, because he says why are you following me why are you pursuing me you know you leave me alone because I don't want to hurt you I don't want to harm you but Asahel wants to pursue him and so at that time Abner is actually forced to kill Asahel but Joab is holding on to that grudge uh, one thing that we see about Joab is Joab is a man of uh, a lot of anger and there's a lot of uh, grudges inside him. Again and again, we see him doing things which are crooked, uh, not a very nice person. Uh, so in this case, uh, he kills Abner and David is very displeased. He says, uh, you know, this was not the correct way for you to act. And so in fact, he has a public mourning held for Abner. Um, so 
so that it's very clear to everyone that he was not involved in any kind of conspiracy and it was joab who on his own acted and so he holds a kind of public mourning ceremony for abner and then in the meantime what happens is that uh, two of saul's army captains they go to ishbosheth and again they use trickery to kill ishbosheth so now ishbosheth is dead abner is dead um so now there are no other contenders to the throne and also when ishbosheth dies again david does not rejoice again he you know says that what was done this assassination of ishbosheth is a wrong thing and he condemns it he publicly condemns it so maybe the tribes who were looking at david's attitude in all of these things maybe they realize that this man is a man of integrity he's not rejoicing that just because you know for him things have worked out well but rather he is condemning the wrong that was done so maybe because of that uh, the rest of the tribes they come to him and they say you know we would like you to be king over all of us and not just the tribe of juda and that's basically how uh, david becomes the king of the entire nation and once david becomes king of the entire nation any survivors from saul's family would be very very scared because when you have a new king who has come to the throne and he is from a different lineage then the all the sons of the previous king would be very afraid because uh, the new king will generally want to finish off the competition so he would kill off all the remaining survivors and uh, so uh, mephibosheth who is still alive mephibosheth who is a son of um, jonathan actually so he is still alive Uh, and so when david says call mephibosheth to my presence mephibosheth comes over there really thinking that he's going to be killed now and so when he comes into the king's presence it says he literally prostrates himself on the floor in front of david and uh, he says yeah i know your servant uh, something like that he's trying to uh, get you know get back his life because he's so worried about what is going to be done to him but david did not call him to uh you know to kill him or to take any kind of action against him rather david has called him to show him kindness uh, because one thing we learn about mephibosheth is that when that battle took place at jezreel you know where saul uh, killed himself and his sons also died in the battlefield when all that was going on uh, mephibosheth was still a young child and when his uh, nurse the lady who was looking after him gets to know that all the other sons have been killed by the philistines she is worried that they'll come even for this little child and so she takes up the child and she's running from that place and accidentally she drops him so mephibosheth becomes lame in both feet he's a cripple he cannot walk uh, you know properly so um david shows him great kindness he says now onwards you will be like part of the royal family and you will sit at my royal table and eat along with me it's a privilege which is given only to very few so that privilege is given to mephibosheth and in fact all the property which belongs to you know the personal property of saul he puts it all now in the name of mephibosheth so he does not take any of saul's personal fields and you know buildings and all of that uh, so in all of these things david displays great integrity he conducts himself in a honorable manner but you know he too has his failings and one of his first failings that we see is when he is trying to bring in the ark of the covenant he wanted to do a good thing but the way he went about doing that good thing uh, was displeasing in the eyesight of god so you and i who have come to bible college who uh, want to do something good for the lord we need to be careful on how we are conducting ourselves and uh, how we are uh, you know making our choices because just because we chose to come to bible college god is not going to say oh okay i'm going to overlook all their defects no for him the motives of the heart are important the way we conduct ourselves is important the choices that we make is important because uh, you know he's a honorable god and he expects us also to be very honorable in our conduct and uh, so over here even though david had a good intention in his heart he wanted to bring the ark into jerusalem but the way he did it 
was very displeasing to the Lord because he was using uh, procedures which God had not told. Uh, so let's actually look at that incident and we will look at a few details. Um, some of you, of course, may, may already be familiar with this. But then for those of us who are not very familiar with the details, it would be good for us to look at this. So we would maybe read out 2 Samuel chapter 6. So, so, so over here, if we can have one, somebody read out 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. And the rest of us will just follow even as the person reads. Uh, was eight. Yeah. And then did you talk about the Perezuza part? You did, is it? Oh, okay, fine. Um, all right. So over here, we see that um, they are bringing the ark in a new cart ox you know cart which is um, drawn by oxen and um, the cart stumbles a little bit because maybe the cart went over a few stones or something and so when the cart is wobbling the ark which is inside looks like as if it may fall out so Uzzah is concerned so he reaches out to support the ark so that it doesn't fall down to the ground and God is very displeased that he touched the ark because the instructions were very clear that nobody should touch the ark and so when he does that, um, you know, the anger of the Lord burns against him and he drops down dead. And it says in verse 8 that David became angry about it. He didn't like it that the Lord did this. And so he gives the name, uh, that place, a name. He calls it Perez Uzzah, which means God's outburst against Uzzah. He's like, you know, he's saying, why? Why did God, you know, release his anger against Uzzah? So he is very upset about it. Now, so, why was God angry? Was it, um, I mean, uh, what was the reason? So, uh, for that, we would have to, you know, kind of look at what was the correct procedure and what exactly was the wrong thing which these people were doing. So, if one, somebody could read out Exodus chapter 25, verses 14 and 15. Exodus 25, 14 and 15. And 16. Yeah, OK. Uh, so the correct procedure was that uh, when the ark was originally made, they had these large rings attached to the sides so that you can put a pole through the um, through the rings and lift it up. So they would nobody would actually touch the ark. They would only put the poles through the I uh, know to the sides and they would lift up the poles uh, and uh, then they would literally carry it on their shoulders. And it's only the Levites who are permitted to do that, not just about anyone who feels like it, but only the Levites who have been consecrated and sanctified for this particular task, they would carry it upon their shoulders. That was the correct way for them to uh, do it. Um, but what actually happens over here in the way David plans the whole thing? Uh, we, so let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 3. Mm. And uh, verse 4. Yes. So they did not follow this procedure of carrying it on their shoulders using the poles. Rather, they put it in a cart. Why did they put it on a cart? Why could not they have thought of some other way of transportation? It's because that's the way the Philistines used to honor their gods. 
you know if, if you remember even when the philistines were trying to return the ark to the uh, israelites they send it in a cart because that's the way of that's the way they used to honor their gods and now when david is using that kind of transportation he is almost equating yahweh with all these other gods and uh, the lord is not just another god he is the one who has made everything and uh, he is the one who has always delivered the israelites and been there for them he expects higher loyalty he expects more reverence out of them so maybe you could say that okay david being a king what would he know about the procedures and all that but then the levites what was their main job they were not asked to go and fight in battle okay which was very clearly told to them the levites will not participate in the battle as soldiers they will go to the field uh, you know to gather instructions from god and convey it to the army but they will not do any fighting so that they they have no work regarding uh, army and they don't have any work regarding farming because the others are doing all the farming and then they bring their tithes to the temple and these people just sit over there and they eat their, their only main work is taking care of all the religious spiritual matters and they are being give, being given free land for that they are being given free food for that it is the only task to educate themselves in the scriptures and teach it to the people so whether or not david knew about how the correct procedure you know it should be undertaken they would have had more brains uza would have known about it ahio his i you know the other uh, person um, the, the other brother he also would have known about these things so why didn't they take it seriously why did they allow this um, ark to be transported on a cart you know following the philistine example of doing things which which should be like uh, like a slap in the face for yahweh because he is being equated with just some man made god and uh, the lord would not have liked that so after doing that the uh, the cart it stumbled and now uh, like uzza is suddenly acting all very concerned and is reaching out to support it god is not able to you know contain his anger anymore and he unleashes it uh, so these levites uzza and ahio should have known better in case they have not bothered to open the scriptures of moses and read through what has been commanded it's their fault they should have actually done that they should have opened their uh, scriptures their scrolls and looked through whatever had been taught so they failed to do that and um, then you know we saw that david's first reaction was that he was angry and he named that place perez uzza now we see another response in the you know following verses uh, verses 9 to 11 2 samuel 6 9 to 11 if we could have one person read out please verse yeah verse 11 okay so first reaction david was angry then later on he must have you know someone must have explained to him why those people died that there is there is a correct procedure to do it and they have not followed the correct procedure so once he must have realized what his mistake is he is no longer angry now he is scared he is thinking my goodness this god is too holy he when he says something he means it and if we contradict what he is saying and we do our own thing uh, then he cannot just you know ignore it or settle for it because he is too holy so now david is afraid it says that he was unwilling now to bring the ark into the jerusalem because he is scared if he brings the ark into jerusalem what will happen to the whole of jerusalem you know because if they do something foolish because suddenly uh, david is now realizing that this yahweh is not just another god like the philistine gods he is all you know i mean all knowing the one and only and uh, uh, his holiness level is completely perfect so uh, god will not tolerate recklessness and carelessness once he realizes that he is so afraid he thinks no 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 
you know all these days the ark was sitting in uh, the house of abinadab um you know not abinadab in whose house was it um uh, if i can remember my facts no that's the next person who into whose house it goes but earlier when they were they bring they were bringing it out um it was in the house of can't seem to get the exact verse anyway um oh yeah it was in abinadab's house it was there with them true it was um, no abinadab is the dad of uh, uzza and ahio so now um, so he says you know i he cannot bring it into jerusalem he's scared obviously he doesn't want to put it back in abinadab's house because you know god already struck down those two sons so he takes it into a new house he he goes to obey the edom and says now onwards this ark is going to be in your house so can you just imagine how obey the edom would have felt when he got this good news that now the ark is going to be in his household so i can just imagine how careful that entire family would have lived from that moment because they are now aware that a very holy god is right there in their presence and that is how we should actually be living we have the holy spirit within us and we tend to take him lightly sometimes because we forget like david we forget how holy this god is and we think we can just get away with you know the words we speak and the wrong attitudes we have and we don't realize that we are in the presence of someone extremely holy uh, so holy that he literally had to uh, sacrifice his son to you know make atonement for us nothing else would have worked so he he is that holy so obey the edom discovers that now he is going to have to live with the ark and they must have lived in a way that really honored god they must have been really careful in their lifestyle and so when god sees their sincerity he begins to bless obed edom's house a lot and when david hears about it how wonderfully obed edom's home is being blessed now he wants the blessing now we say okay in that case if god is blessing them let us bring the uh, ark into jerusalem okay so now this time he is very careful how he does it the explanation is actually given in first chronicles you know we don't exactly have the wording over here in uh, uh, second samuel but let's read out that um, because when we are covering first chronicles we'll not touch upon this story once again you no know, we'll be talking about other things so let's just look at first chronicles chapter 15 and if we could have one person read out verses 12 to 15 uh first chronicles chapter 15 verses 12 to 15 so now uh, he says to them you know sanctify yourselves and follow the correct procedure because he says in verse 13 you did not do it uh, correctly the first time and so the lord our god broke out against us in anger so he says um, you know do it correctly and so they're very careful in how they sanctify themselves and in verse 15 it says they bore the ark of god on their shoulders by its poles just as moses had commanded and so now this time the lord is pleased with the uh, the you know uh, repentance that they are showing and with the honor that they are showing towards him so in the little things that we do in our everyday uh, life the way we talk to people uh, the you know choices that we make if we make an extra effort to truly honor him he notices people may notice or not notice they may praise you or they may not praise you uh because humans are limited you know we can't observe everything and praise everything but god notices he notices every attitude of your heart and if you're doing something truly uh wanting to please him wanting to follow his instructions he will reward you for it in his time you know because uh god notices these things all right uh coming to the you know the covenant that god makes with david 
uh, we would find that in second samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 16 it's a very important passage um, generally referred to you know as the davidic covenant so uh, second samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 16 if we can have someone read out and then we will look at the different layers which are mentioned in that particular uh, passage Yes. So this is the promise that God is giving to David and his descendants. And um, just like many of the things that the Lord says, uh, we see many layers to this. Because some of the wording over here applies directly to Solomon, and some wording applies to his descendants, but some of the wording is applying to the Messiah alone. So. Um, usually in prophecies that God gives regarding the future. And over here in this case, you know, in this covenant where God is talking about what will happen, uh, we tend to see layers. Okay, so it's the same even with um, the passage in Isaiah, you know, where it talks about the virgin birth. If you look at that passage over there, there's one layer which was fulfilled in the time of Isaiah. But there was another additional layer which only was fulfilled when Jesus was born, you know, in the New Testament. So we have to um, realize this about the writings in the Old Testament. Sometimes when God speaks, he's just talking about that particular situation at that time. But sometimes there, there will be uh, uh, many layers to what he is saying. One part of it will be fulfilled at that time, but there'll be other parts of it which will be fulfilled later on. So this is something that we need to take note of. So when we are looking at this passage, you know, you try to assess which portion is applying to uh, to David's human sons and which portions are applying only to the Messiah. It says in uh, verse 16, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. And he says, I will establish his kingdom. So whose kingdom is God talking about over here? If you look in your verse 13, he is the one who will build a house for my name. So very obviously over here, it is talking about Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It's talking about Solomon's throne, which will be established forever. But Solomon won't be alive forever to enjoy it. His descendants would be alive. And um, then, of course, it says, I will be his father and he will be my son. And then it says, when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men. So over here, it's referring to the human descendants of David. When they sin against the Lord, the Lord says, I will bring judgment upon you. So be warned. Just because a great promise is being given to you, it doesn't mean that you, know, you can get away with whatever sinful attitude you want. You will be judged if you fail to follow what has been uh, you know, commanded by me. And uh, so uh, he says next in verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And uh, we find very similar wording to this um, regarding Jesus Christ. Uh, so that would be Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 33. Luke chapter 1. Verses 31 to 33, if we can have one person read out, please. And uh, 33. Mm 
okay so uh, these wordings the last portion of this um, davidic covenant where it says your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me your throne will be established forever those words are fulfilled in the messiah okay so uh, we see that but many of the israelites failed to understand that and which is why they went into such terrible sin you know in the generations which followed and we will see that in first kings second kings chronicles uh, how terribly they lived and they were under the impression that god has said no no the throne will be established forever so it doesn't matter how sinful we are what we do how we live the throne will be established forever so when jeremiah comes along and he says you know watch out jerusalem is going to fall they say ha how can jerusalem fall the throne will be established forever and throughout his lifetime jeremiah is persecuted because they are saying this man is speaking lies even though jeremiah was prophesying what god wanted so they had a wrong understanding of this um, you know covenant which has been made and uh, so it was not in the human kings that it was finally fulfilled but rather in the messiah who came through the davidic lineage it was finally fulfilled uh, through through jesus christ all right uh, we now are almost at 11:40 11:37 actually anyone has doubts if you do not have doubts my threat is that i'll continue giving a lecture anyone has doubts no yeah okay uh, at, at the premium you know, we can just use a few more minutes talk about another uh, aspect um david had two high priests rather strange right i mean generally you're supposed to have one high priest but over here in david's case he had two high priests one was zadok and the other was abiathar now zadok belonged to the aaron lineage he was one of the descendants of aaron abiathar on the other hand was uh, a descendant from eli you know the one against whom god speaks um if we go back to our first samuel and if we were to look at chapter 2 first samuel chapter 2 where god is speaking to eli through a man it doesn't say who then doesn't give the name of the prophet but if you go back in your bibles to first samuel chapter 2 uh, the second portion of chapter 2 where you have a man coming and making a prophecy and telling eli what's going to happen to his lineage over there god speaks and god says uh, you know because of the way your sons have been dishonoring me uh, your priestly line will be cut off no longer will your uh, family continue to uh, you know serve as uh, high priests so he talks about how the lineage is going to come to an end if we can have one person read out the last two verses first samuel chapter 2 i think it would be verses 35 and 36 i think are the last two verses if we could have one person read out go ahead yeah ki so uh the prophecy given over there is that uh, you are you will no longer have this honorable position of being in the high priestly line and so your descendants those who are left many of them will die because of god's judgment but those who are left they will literally be begging for any kind of job you know so they will they will come to the new person whom i'm appointing and they will say please give us some kind of priestly jobs so that we can support our family so that we can continue to live so the lord says that will happen to you and even after that man comes and makes that prophecy eli really does not correct his sons he just simply scolds them once uh, but then he doesn't really take any action you know he, he eli was the high priest he could have uh, publicly you know um, um, what removed them from their position he could have said you will no longer be occupying this position you know and you're disqualified and he could have appointed new people but he doesn't do that he just simply scolds them and leaves it like that and they don't change their behavior uh, yes
So uh, no, the, the question I raised over here is that, um, OK, the observation made over here uh, in the class is that uh, Job's sons and daughters also uh, committed sins. And when they did that, uh, Job does not correct them, but rather he just makes sacrifices on their behalf. Um, and uh, one thing that we can note is that all of us also commit sins, uh, but um, none of us actually have gone to the extent where we have gone to the temple of God and uh, used our position uh, to commit immorality publicly. Everyone knows what they are doing, you know, because they were sleeping with the ladies who have been appointed over there to take care of the uh, temple. And uh, they are publicly taking pieces of meat, which were supposed to be offered as sacrifices. They're saying, you know, if you boil the meat, the meat will get, we want fry, we don't want boil. So they say, you know, please give, a, give us that sacrifice before you boil it. And the poor people who come over there to make their sacrifices to the Lord, they're saying, at least allow us to complete the sacrifice, then you take the meat. They're saying, no, no, you'll spoil it by boiling it. Give it to us first, because we want to have fry. I mean, like as if, you know, it's some kind of cafe or a hotel. I mean, this is the, the presence of God is there in that temple, and God is allowing all these rituals with the idea that he will, you know, be able to continue living in their presence because he will look he will look at those sacrifices and he will remember what Christ is going to do in the future and he will put up with them. So what God is doing is something very gracious and these people are taking it so light. So you and I sin and Job's sons and daughters also were sinning but this was completely sin on a different scale. So you know so this could not be taken lightly. Um, Eli could not have just simply offered some sacrifices and said, Lord, pardon them. No. Um, if you notice, even today, uh, you know, we are supposed to be repentant. So repentance is one of the conditions. Yes, the sacrifice has been made, but uh, God expects repentance and change and transformation. That is important. So we cannot just say, oh, sacrifice is made. Now I can do what I want. Uh, so yeah, getting back to what we were talking about. Um, where were we? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So um, uh, Eli's descendants would be in that pathetic position where they would literally beg for any kind of position so that they can, you know, feed their families and be able to uh, live. So what happens next is what we see in um, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 16 to 19, where you have a different story going on. Um, David, poor David, you know, he's running for his life. He's trying to hide everywhere that he can think of. And uh, or you have these spies who manage to find out where he is, and they go and give the report to the to king saying, you know, this guy is hiding over here. He's hiding over there. So over here in this particular instance, um, um, if you look, I think, in the previous chapter, 1 Samuel 21, David, uh, he, he comes to the temple, um, I think, to meet with Samuel and is asking for help. And so at that time, when David comes over there to ask for help, for protection, uh, you have um, Saul's chief herdsman, okay? Uh, Saul's chief herdsman named Doeg, or however on earth you pronounce his name, D-O-E-G. Okay, that guy is also present over there at that time. And he sees David asking for help. So he knows where David is hiding now. And so he goes and reports about it to, the, to Saul. And Saul becomes really angry that the priests and uh, the leaders over there in the temple are taking David's side and protecting him. So when uh, Saul gets to know that, he is very angry. And he gives a commandment saying, let all the priests of the Lord be killed. I mean, it's a very terrible thing. Imagine uh, he's ordering that the priests of God be killed, just murdered, just like that. And uh, so... Um, uh, Doeg is the one who carries out the orders. Uh, that would be in verse 18, 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 18. Uh, Doeg, he kills 85 people who are there uh, at the temple. And then he goes to Nob, a place named Nob, which is a place where many of the priests are living. He goes over there and it says he kills the men and the women and the children and the infants and even the animals which the priests possess. 
it's like really sad a complete large scale massacre and the one person who survives this massacre is a is this guy ab arthur so david kind of takes him under his wing ab arthur is the one person who's able to survive and he is a descendant of eli so david is sorry for him and so he kind of starts you know um, looking after him so that's basically how you have um, uh, ab arthur coming under the shelter of david so later on when david becomes king you obviously have zadok who belongs to the lineage of aaron uh, he is the high priest but he also gives a priestly position to ab arthur so that ab arthur also will be able to uh, you know uh, have some kind of position and livelihood so throughout the lifetime of david ab arthur is very loyal to him uh, but in in the time of solomon for some reason ab arthur decides not to be faithful to solomon he helps so uh, he he tries to you know get involved in some kind of conspiracy against solomon and so at that time solomon he completely disqualifies him and so from that point on um um ab arthur is no longer in the priestly line and that's how god's um, you know judgment upon that family uh, is finally fulfilled so after ab arthur there is there is nobody left in the priestly line from the house of eli so um it's ab arthur who makes that mistake he chooses to join in some kind of conspiracy against solomon and that's basically how those things work out so from that time onwards zadok becomes the high priest and he belongs to the lineage of aaron so there are many many other stories many other conspiracies many other schemes and plans which the people make because this book is filled with politics all right so we cannot get into all of those details uh, but we try to look at some of the spiritual implications of these things which were occurring at that time uh, anyone has a question otherwise we can close with a word of prayer all right so um we'll close all right lord we just thank you so much for today's class we thank you for the things that we could learn from the lives of these people you put in this story so lord in your words so that we can learn from them so we pray oh lord that we would stand warned lord we pray that we would have a, an attitude of respect and reverence towards you um these people oh lord some of the people that we have talked about today uh, treated you with very very lightly with in in a very dishonorable manner and uh, lord that was very displeasing in your sight but lord today we are in a more serious position in the sense we have the holy spirit literally living inside of us so oh lord we need to be so much more careful in the way we live and the choices that we make so we pray oh lord that you would continually remind us of these truths and help us to live lives that truly honor you oh lord lord we pray that you would strengthen us and guide us and cause us to grow in our spiritual walk with you thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you um, thanks online uh, students and also thank you for you know all of you for paying attention uh, we'll close the recording